Welcome to Meadowbrook Gardens, where the wild things grow and the wild things go. Two miles of gardens and birdhouses along Meadowbrook Creek in the southeastern neighborhood of Syracuse, New York. We get people driving in from, you know, Fayetteville, Manlius, you know, the eastern suburbs, just coming down Meadowbrook, you know, just to see the flowers. People just say, I, I go in the morning and I come at night. In the summertime, that's my route. Winter, I go to the highway. It's always been a beautiful street because of the stream and it's a divided street and it winds and people run on it, but the end caps and the birdhouses really took it to a whole nother level. The Meadowbrook Gardens Association first came together around 2012. That's when three local residents, Dave Kirby, and we're a 503C, Dan Stricker, this is a rebuild. This was down on Meadowbrook. And Connie Palem. The people who work on the gardens are a diverse group of people, which is fun. Galvanized a community of volunteers dedicated to the beautification of their neighborhood. Volunteers like Tony Pastelock. It's really wonderful when people drive by and they stop and they say, thank you so much, it looks so pretty. And that really kind of pumps you up to want to keep on doing more. The headwaters of Meadowbrook Creek reside in the Comstock Commons development in outer Comstock. A long, long time ago, it was a whole other world. <laughs> it said the pond was also the habitat of venturous boys fishing for minnows. During the 1800s, the waterway was known at various times as Kinney's Creek and Tyrell's Brook. Same course, different century, flowing under Calvin Street below the Syracuse University Athletic Complex, re-emerging on Lancaster and Buckingham Avenues, navigating around Barry Park, and then gliding through Meadowbrook Gardens. This old creek ain't got no time, rockin' and rollin' along. Catch a wave, catch a breeze, catch it if you can. This old creek is DeWitt bound, over, under, and out. Meadowbrook Creek divides the hilly terrain of two of Syracuse's most distinguished neighborhoods, rich in architecture and history. On one side is Scott Holm, registered as a National Historic District. The area was undeveloped farmland until early in the 20th century. That's when the invention of the electric streetcar encouraged city dwellers to escape their urban centers for the greener pastures of the suburbs. And by the mid-teens, the farmland that was to become the Scott Home Track was ripe for development. Instead of relying on a regimented street grid, landscape designer Arthur C. Comey laid out a much different path for the neighborhood. It called for irregular park-like patterns, wide medians, and tree-lined avenues. Such an exclusive neighborhood required a higher class of homes in an eclectic mix of architectural styles. Renowned Syracuse architect Ward Wellington Ward is represented by three of his works, each one now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Meanwhile, across the creek, over 100 acres of farmland were being converted into Bradford Hills. Ads for the new development were gushing with superlatives. It was proclaimed a place where town and country meet. In the center of a new frontier. High, dry, and clear. featuring a better class of homes. This exclusive community even had their own private golf course, the Bradford Hills Country Club. Located south of Euclid and Standish, the 
3,000 yard nine hole course extended all the way to Tecumseh Road. Life was mighty good in the new frontier. At one time, the old creek had a mind of its own. In the uh, 60s, the residents who lived along Meadowbrook Drive, if we had a big rainstorm, the uh, creek would overflow and then the, their basements would get flooded and they'd lose their washer and dryer, hot water, furnace. In the 1970s, Richard and Maurice Wilkins lived at 429 East Genesee Parkway. We lived in a house that was a slab, no basement, and we were hit tremendously with seven inches of water through our house twice. And we were really next to a very, very narrow brook, which was beautiful until we were hit with torrential rain for almost 24 hours. So never ever thought that a peaceful and beautiful area like that would be devastated in such a way that finally something was done for the neighborhood. And this was part of the Meadowbrook um, cleansing and, and redoing. That redoing was the creation of the Meadowbrook Detention Basin next to Barry Park. Uh, what happens when it rains, all the water floods off and it comes here into uh, the Meadowbrook Detention Basin. And then from there it slowly regulates how quickly the water will flow down Meadowbrook Drive. Inadvertently, the solution to the creek flooding created a community asset. People started walking along it, and then over time, the path just extended. And then our group, about 10 years ago, we started mulching it with the permission of the county. On a weekend, you can come over here and you'll see, you know, three, four, five hundred people walking. And flying. And in the basin, there are some fish, and you'll find a lot of um, osprey in here. It's almost like a part of a migration path in the, you know, for birds. <laughs> For still photographer John Ferris, the pond brings opportunities. Probably 60 or 70 different species of birds come through here every year. an osprey that comes by often. Check him out, check him out. Tell him the fish hawks. Well, I know what it means to me. It's a jewel. It's just, uh, it's an Eden, an urban uh, paradise. These days, the old creek has been transformed into a centerpiece of community pride. What divides also unites. A common cause for action and a common cause for beauty. We have 28, they're called NCAP captains, and that person is responsible for that NCAP, and their job is to make sure that they've got volunteers, it stays watered, it stays weeded. Uh, the expectation is that they won't do all the work themselves, but they'll get their friends and neighbors. We have over 100 volunteers that do that. It's beautiful that people have taken the time to really to do something that gives everyone a chance. It helps every grouping, young and certainly the seniors who can do something with their lives and those who really know the difference of what nature is and how to go about to make it more beautiful. So there's a local group that was doing some um, you know, landscape improvements along Meadowbrook. Landscape architect and Meadowbrook Gardens resident Dudley Breed developed a plan 
to unify the design of the areas around the creek. I thought that it would be kind of nice actually to, to connect the Nottingham school into the broader community. And one way to do that was just to visualize it like an endpoint on a necklace and then have the, the necklace itself along Meadowbrook and then a whole series of small parks and individual end cap gardens uh, all along the way. And then terminate uh, down at Berry Park. Now, and this kind of takes off on the famous uh, Boston's emerald necklace that's been uh, uh, famous for since the uh, uh, late 1800s. In order to make the Nottingham expanse more park-like, Dudley organized a community tree planting along Meadowbrook Drive. We ended up uh, planting almost, I think, better than 30. But he wasn't done yet. At Euclid and Meadowbrook, the midpoint along the Jade Necklace, Dudley created a much more inviting environment. Uh, people were saying, well, we wanted to put some benches along this pathway, and they were going to put the benches out here by the sidewalk. And uh, I said, you know, that's, you know, it's kind of bright and it's right close to the, all the traffic in there. Wouldn't it be better maybe to use this, we got this little green space here, why not use it? So benches and service bearing bushes were added to the little green space. The idea that you can get into a green area and it's very calming and soothing. They love coming down Meadowbrook because it's so whimsical. It's amazing. The minute you put them up, birds start moving in. It adds spice. I started out with smaller holes. I started out with uh, maybe um, an inch. And then I find uh, the birds are not happy with an inch. They start chewing on the They chew their own hole open. Dan so Stricker is the person most responsible for that Creekside uh, whimsy. Hole. One late summer day in 2011, he noticed the perennials on his end cap were fading. And I figured, well, what can I do to spiff it up? And came up with the idea, we'll uh, build and erect a birdhouse. A week later, and a few blocks down at Crawford and Meadowbrook, Tim Robinson built a birdhouse clone of his home on the corner. Dan Stricker did a birdhouse and I was just doing one to uh, reflect his, his craftsmanship. And then... So I put another birdhouse up across from Nottingham High School. And of course it was only natural. It seemed appropriate to put a church birdhouse across the street from a church. Well, then for Dan, one thing led to another and another and another. You know, people come to see these little birdhouses. I'm only sorry that our little strip doesn't have any. I've complained, but I haven't gotten one yet. <laughs> so hopefully soon. And now we have a new builder. His name is Gary Steele. And Gary sort of taken over where Dan left off. He just did one at the corner of uh, Euclid and Meadowbrook and it's directional. He's got north, south, east, west. This is a busy intersection. This is uh, sort of the heart of the neighborhood here. Uh, you know, it's Syracuse University down the street, DeWitt going the other way. Then I got the idea of a weather vane and I wanted a bird on it. I shared uh, with the white one and the one with the little blue bird on it, uh, the one common roof serving for both of them, sort of tied the whole thing together. And then he built another one at, at the corner of Broad. It's a big white house. This one they asked me to make. Uh, they gave me a picture of it. Uh, they wanted a, a big one here. Well, I made a big one. Actually, the only birdhouses are on the lower level. I made false holes on the top. Are the birds paying taxes on the houses? Of course. <laughs> There's no free lunch, right? Except at my end cap where they put a lunch wagon. I actually found a remote control car with wheels and the car didn't function, it was rotten, but I saved the wheels and I said I gotta do something with it. Some of the paint I used wore off, so you don't really see the details that you did the first day up. It's on my repair to-do list. It had a Jeep grill, and instead of saying Jeep, it said cheap. Oh, I love the Minion. 
I think he's fun, and it's beautifully executed. It just came to me. I, th I thought it'd be funny. A lot of people don't like it, but hey, they'll get over it. It's about the kids. I'm sure kids like it. Without a doubt, the Minion really grows on you. Yes, it's adorable, and the kids love seeing that. Tim's airplane birdhouses also flew the friendly skies over this Meadowbrook end cap. A couple of people said I couldn't do it, so I did it anyhow. And then when uh, it got stolen, I made the biplane, and I just wanted to make it better. And boy, did he. Weighing 50 pounds and six feet long and wide, the 10-room birdhouse was quite a load to launch. Through all kinds of weather, the vessel never missed a connection. But eventually, age caught up with the craft, and she had to be grounded. And today, the Minion commands the airspace. This is one of the first birdhouses. It's just kind of a multiplex, and it's kind of lasted, and it's, it's in line for replacement. Um, but the birds just are not going to leave. Now, with global warming, they tend to live there year round. The birds, they come up here, and there's usually a lot of them. And as soon as I pull up and I'm in here, they're up here, they're just squawking at me, and they're flying in and out. And then they'll come down on the rail, and they'll just sit down there, and they're just squawking at me the whole time, like, what are you doing here? You know, you're interrupting us, we're trying to have some fun up here. So this one I built about eight, ten years ago. Some of those birds you see up there that were just hanging around the house, they were from decorations, little, those little ringing things you see on people's porches and whatnot. Three separate houses, I just put them together and there you go. And this is uh, one of the birdhouses I coordinated the color with. There's yellow sunflowers and there's yellow on the birdhouse. The uniqueness, if you will, of this thing is there's uh, holes in the very top and they've got stained glass in there and I put a solar powered spotlight in there. So in the evening, if you come by and it's dark, you should see the different colors in the top floor of the birdhouse. The SU basketball was taken down and that was vandalized. Eight room birdhouse, poplar. Shaping the circular ball was a painstaking process requiring a delicate touch with a file. Three by three square pieces of wood, all glued, screwed together. I couldn't tell you how many pieces, it was a bazillion. Took it on a Friday night. How they did it, I don't know, all the noise they must have made. And they dragged it around the block. It actually, it did everybody a favor because it was all fading. It was looking really, really bad. The ball was refurbished with a fiberglass finish and a fresh coat of paint. Much to the dismay of some, the ball is no longer a birdhouse, but for others... We love our basketball. It is the gateway to Syracuse University and all the comings and goings, which is exciting because we are an integral part of that community, needless to say. I built them in the winter in the basement and I got carried away. This is what carried away looks like. 16 holes at Euclid and Meadowbrook and 16 holes at Hurlburt and Meadowbrook. It's just stuff I had on the workbench that uh, needed to leave, and I found a place for them on uh, both uh, birdhouses. The design you come up with, I have it in my head. You think about it for a couple of days, and then this is what comes up. And it's just kind of a, a wacky thing. The more I built it, um, the wackier it got. When you're building a birdhouse, it's got to be fun. Whimsical is something that, well, you know, it's not really necessary, functionally necessary. That's not a term you'd hear highway engineers using. But as far as making a uh, neighborhood livable uh, and fun, even, light, then it, that serves that purpose well. Do you think the squirrels feel neglected because they don't have birdhouses? <laughs> Perhaps they do, but maybe they enjoy the activity around them. <laughs> Meadowbrook Creek, it's just it's a little piece of nature in the middle of the city.
makes it less city, more country, I guess. More special. lucky. Look at Syracuse. Who would know that we live in a place with so so much nature? Well, this old creek just keeps moving on. Damn straight. Traveling light. And leaving it all behind. A passing fancy, just passing time. DeWitt bound. Gone, gone, gone.